I think we're ready to start. Uh, welcome to this webinar on COVID-19 and uh, development policy. And uh, at NUPI today, we're joined by the Norwegian Minister for Development, International Development Aid, Dagen Ulstein, and we are sitting here with uh, carefully measured <laughs> one meter social distancing. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, you will be uh, just two pieces of practical information at first. Uh, uh, this uh, session will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can also participate in this meeting. You do so by uh, participating in uh, using the chat function. And uh, you can ask questions and please uh, do that right away. So you can start uh, submitting your questions. And you can also like, uh, push like on uh, questions and they will pop up and, and we will ask those questions to the minister later on. Now the topic today is COVID-19 and implications for development policy in general and also in particular for Norwegian development policy. Uh, COVID-19 is of course a major global crisis. Uh, the pandemic is, obvious, uh, is obviously a global health crisis. More than 7 million are infected and more than nine, uh, uh, and more than four hundred thousand people have died. I think that more than two hundred countries have registered infected people. So this is a truly global crisis, and it's a big test for health systems in most countries. Uh, COVID nineteen has also triggered an economic crisis. IMF has warned that this is the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression in the late 1920s. And many developing countries are strongly affected by a drop in investments, outflow of capital and currency depreciation. In addition, they are strongly affected by a collapse in tourism industry, a sharp fall in remittances and a sharp fall in trade, in particular airborne trade. The UN has warned against increased poverty and the risk of a wave of default in developing countries. COVID-19 is also a social crisis and potentially as triggering a security crisis. People all over the world are stuck in quarantine and schools are closed, leading to social tensions and uh, weaknesses in the health and uh, in educational systems access to education. In many countries, we also see considerable pressure on national and international institutions and also pressure on individual rights and freedoms. There's a risk of an authoritarian turn. And to top it off, there's a risk that COVID-19 might serve as a conflict magnifier or conflict amplifier, making the security situation more dramatic. So we are faced with a very dramatic I would say, and difficult global situation. In some sense, COVID-19 has exposed and further added to the deep inequalities and injustices in the world. And as often is the case, developing countries are losers. They often have large populations, fewer resources and less capacity to manage crisis. We can, of course, hope that the heat and a high share of young people in the population can make them less vulnerable, but yet studies suggest that we are facing potentially devastating consequences. The number of people living in extreme poverty is likely to increase significantly, and people facing acute hunger is expected to rise from 130 to 250 million by the end of this year. As such, it seems that the pandemic would be a major setback for the ambition to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, and for the goals of tackling climate crisis, reduce inequality in, and eradicate poverty and hunger. So this is the setback, uh, the backdrop for this uh, seminar. We will go into some of these questions and we will ask two, two simple but important questions. So what are the most important challenges for developing countries in the light of COVID-19? And what would these changes and effects mean for international aid and Norwegian development policies. To discuss these questions, we have we are fortunate to have a great panel with us. We have the Minister of International uh, Development, Dag Inge Ulstein, and we have Professor Andy Sumner from King's College in London, and Director for Forum for Development and Environment, 
Katrina Sun Henriksen, in addition, of course, to all of you who can participate in the chat. So, without uh, any further comments from me, I would like to now give the floor to uh, to Doug Inge. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for hosting this uh, important uh, webinar and also for the contribution uh, from, from NewPit to strengthen our knowledge base um, and this uh, unprecedented situation uh, as you, you put a very good backdrop uh, for us. Um, and just to start with, I think we all agree on this, but, but uh, when faced with a virus that, that uh, knows no borders, we really, really need to fight against it also uh, without any borders and and we need uh, cooperation and I need to go a slightly this way someone says my hair <laughs> that's good uh, I'm still in the right line <laughs> that's good um, uh, but, but as I said we, we need more international uh, cooperation and we need to also put uh, all the strong uh, research environments uh, together and for, for, for me and for us as uh, policy uh, makers and politicians, we need to come uh, closer to, to you and your important uh, environments. Um, if it's in the race for a vaccine or it is in understanding the political and economic consequences uh, that the pandemic has uh, brought us into. Uh, and as I said, I, I really think that COVID-19 has made it even more uh, obvious that research-based knowledge always should inform and uh, influence important decisions and actions, uh, both in, in all countries. Um, and uh, according to, I know, the recent Research Council survey, nine out of ten, I think that was the number, uh, Norwegians trust research and science. And this number has increased since the pandemic uh, outbreak. I'm definitely one of those uh, nine, and I hope members of the research community will also following this webinar and will provide comments and, and findings. Uh, so the systematic dialogue and interaction between researchers, policymakers, and decision takers is so important, both in normal times, uh, but uh, even more uh, crucial in times like uh, of the crisis. So I, one of the main challenges of the corona crisis both in Norway and in developing countries is perhaps that we lack solid knowledge and facts of what to expect. Um, the long-term social and economic consequences of COVID-19 may turn out to be more severe um, than the immediate effects on global health. So that is one of the questions that I really hope that with Andy Sumner and, and, and uh, important uh, insights from civil society that we also have together with us here today uh, could, could uh, look uh, more into. Um, since the uh, outbreak, both NUPI, Christian Mikkelsen Institute, PRIO, the Fritio Finance Institute and others have provided valuable research-based uh, knowledge to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I, I really, we use this possibility to thank, uh, thank you all. Um, and as I said, more formative research is, is needed to improve our work in development cooperation in general and particularly also in the light of COVID-19. And that is why um, uh, I also have earmarked uh, 20 million uh, krona for this purpose. I, I really think that we need to come closer all the way, not only have this huge um, 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 uh, research that we know some years afterwards if we made the right decisions or not, but actually come a bit closer and have, have, have more, um, uh, more of, of that research uh, combined also to, to our large project. So, so again, uh, we need to, 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 um, to, to gather more use, useful data on the situation, how it is now and how we can use it. So, so that is why we actually have uh, uh, some task forces, some teams that now are working almost day and night to collect data and to see how we can use the uh, our portfolio in, in in the best way um, and uh, I think it will be a really short summer vacation uh, because this is really really important. Um, I probably use um, a lot of uh, the time that we are a discussion uh, afterwards um, but um, one of one of the challenges, as I see it, is, is as, as, uh, as you also uh, tapped into, the, the coming global recession uh, is also set to increase inequality, discrimination and unemployment around the globe. 
there are many unprecedented challenges um, uh, to our nation and, and to, to all the nations. And I really think that trust into the health system is one of the, the, the key uh, areas. Um, because when we know that over 100 countries still have all their schools locked down, hmm. there are 1.1 billion uh, children and young people out of school uh, today. Uh, so, firstly, the, the health crisis is there and we need to address that. Uh, but at the same time, we see that many of the, the, the effects of the lockdowns have created a massive setback of many of the SDGs. We probably could, 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 could talk before the Millennium Goals in some of the uh, areas. So, so, again, we need to find the right balance and see how we could um, have right and enough um, insights to, 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 to address these issues in the best, best way. So, so that's why I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be together with you today. From my point of view, we should focus on the poor countries, the most marginalized ones in those countries, because again, we are likely to see that the poorest and the most vulnerable pay the highest price in a crisis like uh, this. Uh, and, and with the goal of eradicating extreme poverty by 2030, um, it has become so much more difficult uh, the last three, four months. Um, so I, again, I really think that we need to, to have that uh, as, a, as a clear goal and to focus on the marginalized ones and, 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 and the poor um, and the most uh, less developed countries. Um, again, as I said, um, the more effectively um, we curb the pandemic, I think the faster we can start building back better and, and greener as many uh, governments are talking about these days. Um, and again, trust in the health system and how we actually could use all our investments now to, to improve the healthcare systems um, because there are a lot of money invested uh, during the pandemic uh, and we need to make sure that it's uh, not only uh, we see like a, a restart uh, how the world looked like um, in December last year but how we actually could use this crisis uh, um, in the best way if I could say uh, say so. Um, we have as I said, one of the key actors in, in, in the response is civil society and we have tried to give both civil society and, and, um, and uh, other organizations enough flexibility um, to, to make sure that they could, uh, could, could use um, their skills and their uh, capacity uh, in the midst of, of this uh, crisis um, so they can maintain their activities. Um, and we also allocated more resources to reduce, as I said, the spread of the infection uh, and also improve access to sanitation, clean water and health service. The prevention part of this, uh, when everything's are locked down, we know that civil society uh, with local partners, they are still there and they are so crucial uh, in, in this phase of, of the pandemic. Um, again, the, it requires urgent humanitarian action um, as well as coordinated efforts to, to mitigate the economic and social um, effects on this. Um, some of the other parts is, is the larger channels, the multilateral channels, the IMF as mentioned, uh, World Bank, Africa Bank and other multilateral institutions, uh, both to provide immediate support to keep economic um, uh, economies afloat uh, finance institutions and, and others and also um, how important they are to to make sure that small and medium sized businesses could could actually get through this crisis. Um, so so that's also one uh, important part of our efforts uh, so so far. Um, so just some some few words about the um, vaccine. And I think that um, we start. Well, here we have Andy. Uh, he's online now. Um, we have uh, engaged uh, from the very beginning the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, and I think what we see now, um, in fact, CEPI's current work is an evidence that our long-term development efforts has have given the race towards COVID-19 vaccine a head start. And we also uh, are, are very much engaged in, in the work of Gavi because to have a fair 
allocation system and how to distribute the vaccine uh, to all countries and to make sure that vulnerable groups and um, crucial uh, healthcare workers, uh, the first kind of um, um, uh, the vaccines that are available uh, will be really important, not only for the developing countries, but also for us, for everyone. Uh, because again, it's it's not enough if we try to make sure that we will safeguard our own population, but we need to stand together in this. Uh, and that's uh, that's really sure, sure. So the coordinated effort that WHO and, and others are, are doing are important in, in this uh, way. I think I will... Um, and there, there are a lot of things that we could tap into um, uh, during the questions. I hope many of you will uh, will do so, uh, and we'll have a, a, a good discussion. Uh, I see we also have Andy Sumner together with us here now, uh, and others. Uh, so I think I will stop there and and uh, and continue afterwards. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dongying. Uh, first, let me say just thank you for your interest in and commitment to, to pursuing. Uh, let's say, research-based and knowledge-based uh, uh, development uh, policy. I think it's extremely important uh, uh, the way you stress that uh, uh, how development policy and COVID-19 not only change representing new challenges, mm -hmm. but it also triggers somewhat a rethinking of what you already mm -hmm. have done, because a lot of the things that were planned activities Maybe it's difficult to, to play out now, so you have to rethink a bit. But we, we, we might return to this. Uh, but now let me invite in Andy Sumner from King's College. Uh, uh, just a brief thing. You said that you have uh, worked with the researchers in Norway to provide input, etc. And I also understand that Andy is commissioned to, to mm -hmm. provide us with a, a study of, of some of the implications for of COVID-19 for development policy and poverty, etc. And we've also written uh, some papers that are already out there. Maybe you can give us a pre-peek of the advices you're going to provide uh, during the next few days or weeks. Andy, please, great to have you. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's it's really nice to be, be doing this and I'm, I'm very grateful for the invite. <clears throat> um, it's always nice to have interactions with Norway as the, the most, gener most generous country in the world in terms of aid per person. It's a, it's a real model of multilateralism, I think. <clears throat> so I think, we, if I can say a little bit about the research. So we've done one paper already, and there's a new paper coming this week. The first paper made estimates of the impact of COVID-19 on, on global poverty. The estimates uh, potentially uh, of very large poverty impacts. Even if the economic contraction is just 5%, uh, there could still easily be 80 million new poor people under the $1.90 a day, the global poverty line. Uh, if you look at the higher poverty lines, and if you look at larger economic contractions, there could be half a billion new poor people. So that's clearly a, a very substantial impact. And in the new paper this week, we take a look at the impact on the uh, poverty severity uh, and poverty intensity, and we look at the income shortfall that many of the world's existing poor and new poor um, may, be, uh, may be suffering due to the lockdowns. <clears throat> um, and we also take a look at where the world's uh, new poor uh, are likely to live. Um, and uh, as the discussion goes on, I, I can uh, make a, a few more comments. I think my, my general sense is that um, the poverty impact of the crisis is, is likely to be substantial. Um, that implies there's a, a need for big ideas and, and, and bold moves to do something about this. Uh, there's, um, there's, of course, there's already been a G20 agreement on bilateral debt relief, uh, but countries have to opt into that. And so many countries are not opting into that because they're worried about stigma and rating agencies downgrade. The IMF has already begun a debt relief program for the 25 poorest countries. I can see a very strong case for having a debt standstill over this year and possibly into next year to release funds immediately for social programs. Many developing countries already have cash transfer programs and social programs. Uh, it's just a question of the coverage and the amount of money that's being transferred. So there's a potential to really address this, but it, it, it requires a, a bold plan. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Dagen, would you like to respond to some of these remarks? Yeah, again, thank you, Andy. And we had a discussion uh, last week or the week before, uh, and uh, it's really useful for us to, to be in direct contact with your insights. Uh, and uh, as a direct consequence of that, actually, there's a lot of people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that are win uh, digging really deep into uh, what you shared and, and also other uh, scientists. So, so I really think that we need to, to, to use this crisis to, to take a stop and to, to see uh, the whole portfolio uh, of development. So, so again, thank you for that. And, uh, and there are many aspects uh, of what you, uh, what you shared and the numbers are devastating. If there would be approximately up to uh, half a billion more new, extremely poor or poor in, in, in that range uh, people, uh, we won't have any chance to reach the SDGs by 2030. So when will somebody say that? Uh, and, and how should we actually, yeah, we have never been on track. So, so that, that's the truth, but, but now it's, it seems close to impossible if your research is right. So, so again, what's, how should we address that? Should somebody say that or should we keep quiet or should we, or when should we say that? So sh should I respond? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I, th I think at the moment there's a, there's a bit of caution in, in expressing these kind of wor worries because there's, there's a sense that it, it, uh, um, uh, if you talk about the kind of economic contractions developing countries are about to go through, it may add to the sense of panic amongst investors. And that's a, that's a real concern. So I, I mean, I can understand in some ways why people are, are kind of quiet. The, if you look at across the range of uh, forecasts, the, the IMF tends to be at the lower end, the more optimistic end. And then you have the OECD uh, in somewhere in the middle in terms of their forecasts and then the um, uh, the Asian Development Bank and others seem to be at the higher end. If you want to see some really eye-watering forecasts then you should check out the Goldman Sachs. I mean th these are the guys that know markets very very well. I mean I would take Goldman Sachs very seriously and so what they're talking about in the second quarter of this year you could easily see economic contractions of 20 to 40 percent for that quarter. Uh, the economic contraction for India for this quarter could be over 40 percent. Mm. Over the year as a whole, it's possible that the contractions are more like 10 to 15 percent. So there'll be some kind of um, some kind of, sort of uh, things, things will get slightly better. But what you've got is a very severe and immediate impact. <clears throat> and then you have to ask yourself, what, you know, how is this going to look? If you think of different types of uh, uh, events, you can see events they're a bit like an elastic band. So the, during moments of stress, elastic, the elastic band is stretched. And then after, as long as you don't stretch it too much, after the event, the elastic band springs back to the same kind of shape. Mm. So if there's, if there's enough poverty programs, then it's plausible that people's lives might go back to kind of normal after the event. On the other hand, there are events that are more like paper clips when you stretch a paper clip. So when you stretch a paperclip, it's very difficult to get it back to the same shape. The, the, the paperclip is changed forever. So it could be that the poverty impacts of this crisis are so severe, and that's what we're looking at in terms of uh, poverty severity and poverty intensity in the new paper. The impacts are so severe that actually, even if you have enough social programs, it may not be enough. You may need more. You may need to overcompensate to get things back on track. And as you said, the SDGs weren't looking too good before the crisis. But then you, I guess you have to look at things, if you look at things in a positive view, crisis, crises always open policy space. Things that are unthinkable before crises suddenly become thinkable on the table. So for example, the, if you look at the IMF's debt standstill for the world's 25 poorest countries, why isn't that extended to, to many more developing countries? Why is the World Bank not joining the debt standstill? There was a very interesting letter that the head of the World Bank sent to uh, to, uh, to to senators and to, to civil society. 
that said the World Bank has done a study saying it would not be in the developing countries' interest to have a debt standstill on World Bank. So why does it make sense for the IMF to have debt relief and the World Bank not to have debt relief? I mean, the, the, the line in that letter is, is it just it says that the World Bank have done a study across 10 multilateral development banks, but it doesn't say any of the assumptions or what this is about. And if anyone, the World Bank seems to be downplaying the poverty impact, presumably because if the poverty impact is substantial, then the World Bank really needs to do more and quickly. So I, the good news is you can actually see a kind of three point plan to address this very straightforward in some ways, although delivering things is never easy. I mean, first of all, you need the you need a sort of extension of the debt standstill uh, that the IMF has provided to the poorest countries, to many more countries. Um, and and um, uh, you know e even if that's a debt standstill for a, a year or longer, uh, and then after that, it's unavoidable that some countries are going to need debt restructuring. Absolutely unavoidable, but no one wants to accept it yet. It's in a way, it's everyone's kind of trying to kind of everyone's trying to do this. Can you see that? Yeah. Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> It, it keeps me going with my with my my, my children at home. Um, so uh, home home teaching alongside working is is is, is good fun. Um, so I think um, you know first of all the, the 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 funds are potentially there simply by a debt standstill. The developing world spends over a trillion dollars a year in current dollars in debt servicing. So you know just pausing that for a year in the multilateral development banks, the IMF and the World Bank is entirely plausible. Secondly, developing countries have all the many social programs and cash transfers. Over 100 developing countries have cash transfers. It's just a question of it expanding the, the, the amount that's transferred and the people who benefit. And that, of course, costs more money. And that's where a debt standstill for a year or possibly longer might make sense. Um, and in a sense, it has to be automatic because as I say, with the G20's bilateral debt relief, there's an interesting piece in The Economist where countries are just too too worried to accept debt relief because they're worried that it's it's a de facto default and the markets will punish them for it. So it has to be automatic. And the IMF and the World Bank, you know, the, these countries have boards and the rich countries of the world are very significant on those boards. The rich countries of the world have the power to do this. I think what we need at the moment is the kind of we need we need more people making the moral case. This is a, you know this is this is not just about about um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, doing the doing the right thing. It's about doing it now rather than waiting. And we could wait to wait let the crisis unfold, but but why wait? I mean, in a sense, the G7 won't meet until September. The G20 won't meet until November. You, know, you could also say, why wait to 2030 if we could do something now? So I think the, the potential to do something is there because debt standstills, debt servicing standstills could release the funds. Developing countries have the money and so it could be transferred very quickly. OK, thank you so much. And just very briefly, and then I'll give the floor to Katrina. But in your paper research, well, you, you demonstrate somehow uh, very significant increases in in poverty and severity of poverty but i just wonder what kind of estimates uh, do you make then about a the duration of the epidemic and b mm -hmm. about the kind of the drivers of this economic uh, uh, the, the key factors for this economic uh, downturn is it related to uh, uh, to the collapse of trade is it uh, tourism is it uh, remittances uh, or is it a general decrease in economic activity? Or so, just wondering on the input side of the economy because you look at the output of it. Yeah. So, I mean, on the on the on the duration of the crisis, I mean, at, at the moment, I think we're still stuck in this idea that the crisis will be over in in a year or something. Um, you know, the, the the magical vaccine that's going to appear. We we have no. My understanding is we have no vaccines for other coronaviruses. If a vaccine was found in the next six to 12 months, it would still take, you know, five years or 10 years to roll out to the entire world. And then, you know, who, we have to assume that countries are, are going to ensure that people can pay for it all. So this is I mean, in a way we think this is a crisis, but this is this is potentially the next five or 10 years of our, you know, of, of, of that, that we need to start thinking about. And actually, that is sort of implies again that far more bold action is needed in a sense to move closer towards the SDGs, particularly the public health SDGs. 
Um, and if they could become a number one priority, that would be fantastic, I think, looking forward. In terms of the, the channels of impact, I mean, it, it depends to some extent on the countries you're looking at. Remittances matter a lot more in some countries. The trade channel will be much more significant in other countries. For the immediate impact, the, it's the lockdown to try and control the virus that is going to lead to the poverty impact. But developing countries are in a very difficult place because they don't have the public health system that exists in richer countries. They're trying to do what they can to control the situation, and yet they're still paying debt. You know, the Ethiopian prime minister said, you know, I can either pay the debt or I can look after my country and my people. So we need to think a little bit about the kind of consequences of some of these things that we've seen for many years in terms of, 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 of um, debt flows out of developing countries. But I think in terms of the in terms of the, the, the duration, I think this is this is several years, even if the vaccine is delivered. You're talking about six to eight waves before immunity rises to a level where the infection rate is less so. You've basically got two pandemics. There's a there's a pandemic of COVID and there's also this poverty pandemic that isn't really getting the attention it deserves, although it's been great that that, that uh, Norway are really focusing on this and, and, and also that The Economist has started paying a lot of attention to this issue as well. And then the transmission channels, I think, are really in the immediate term. It's the kind of immediate lockdown that developing countries are, in a way, developing countries are trying to follow developed countries in, when it may not be quite appropriate. Because you can imagine trying to lock down an urban slum and the transmission rates in an urban slum let alone some country governments that are still in denial that the, the problem is there. So I think what's really needed is kind of this kind of global leadership uh, and, and whether it's the G7 or the G20 or the G77. By the way, Norway would be in the G7 if it was per capita income. So there, there's an interesting thought about Norway's uh, very strong uh, position, particularly around the, the most generous country in the world. So I think the, the, uh, the, the things are there. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I think Norway would be in G7, we would be probably G23 or 24, but then maybe the Nordic countries together would be uh, equivalent to. But uh, thanks. Katrina, uh, uh, please, Katrina uh, Sunne Henriksen, please, uh, floor is yours for a brief remark uh, from your view, uh, looking particular perhaps in on uh, sustainable development goals and relationship to climate. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me. It's very good that you want to include civil society in this discussion. Um, and I would like to first, uh, first of all, focus a bit on civil society. Um, as Ulf mentioned, I'm the director of Forum, which is the Norwegian Forum for Development and Environment. Uh, Forum is a network of more than 50 NGOs working with development, environment, peace and human rights. And together our work covers all of the sustainable development goals. And I have to say it's been very interesting to listen to Mr. Ulstein and Mr. Sumner. And I fully agree with what Mr. Sumner has been saying about depth. And I have to say that the that Norway and the Christian Democrats, they have a very proud history in this field. Uh, so I would urge uh, Mr. Ulstein to once again take the lead on this internationally. Uh, Norway has a very good history, a very good track record. Uh, but now I would like to, to add the civil society perspective a little, a little bit more in general and how the work of civil society in the Global South has been affected by the pandemic. Uh, in a crisis situation such as we are in now, it might be easy to focus on the role civil society has as a service provider. Someone who reaches those vulnerable groups that no one else is able to reach. And that is, of course, extremely important. Uh, in the role as service providers, there are many extra challenges now with funding, access to uh, people and just how to organize the work. We see that many NGOs in the Global South are struggling to provide life-saving help while also trying to prevent the spread of the virus. But it's also important to remember that civil society plays an essential role as a critical voice in a society. And we need political activism now, fighting for human rights, for the nature that we all depend on, for the rights of vulnerable groups, such as children or the disabled, or against corruption and poor governance. Civil society organizations fulfill important duties of checks and balances in societies, and they work to hold governments accountable for what they do. If these critical voices are shut down, we know that the rights of a very large part of the population, and in particular those most vulnerable, will not be fulfilled. And the space of civil society was already under a lot of pressure in many countries previous to COVID-19. And with the pandemic, we see that the situation in many places has gone from bad to worse. 
Of course, the nature of the infection control measures makes it difficult for everyone to mobilize and gather people. We see this in Norway as well. But in some countries, the authorities use the situation as a tool to strengthen their powers and further suppress the critical voices. Also, if everyone is inside and no one is looking, political activists might be easier targets for those who want to get rid of, rid of them. We see this, for instance, in Colombia, where several social leaders have been killed during the lockdown. So I just wanted to add this perspective to the discussion. Um, of course, this is important to us as a part of civil society. But a well-functioning civil society is of utmost importance to everyone if we are to achieve the SDGs. I can also add a bit of, on the climate issues if you want that later on. But first okay. of all, I just would like to say something about civil society. Okay, excellent, uh, Katrina. Uh, now we open for for uh, kind of more of a dialogue and we also we bring in some of the questions. We've got lots of questions already in the chat. Uh, but I think, uh, Minister uh, uh we heard now the description of the challenges mm. and so there's and I think that we should discuss briefly about kind of what what is, what are the implications of this for for the policy that mm. you're in charge of. Mm. Uh, so it's about the health challenge. Mm. What kind of policy is it that you can do in related to the health and then the other is related to let's say the indirect effects mm. the economic a downturn, the long term, the increase in poverty, etc. Mm -hmm. And maybe also related to what Katrina said, that this is not only a test in relation to poverty, but also a fundamental test to to the social fabric. Mm -hmm. And what Andy also brought up about sense of justice and uh, distribution of justice, etc. So mm -hmm. on the health issue first, mm -hmm. there are also some questions that have been brought up on this. Mm -hmm. The issue of vaccine mm. is a big issue. Yeah. Uh, of course, Norway has contributed quite a lot to Gavi and also to CEPI, so to fund the innovation of, uh, of, uh, of vaccine, development of vaccine, mm. and that's uh, uh, CEPI, and then Gavi about the distribution uh, access. So, mm. uh, so how do you view this? What kind of role and what kind of perspective do you have on vaccine and what kind of policies do you think is sensible to pursue in order to provide access and uh, affordability of, mm. of access to vaccine, as mm. you see it. I think there are a lot of things that could be said, but but um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that we engaged in CEPI in a very early stage. Uh, and what we see with the, um, uh, not this Ebola outbreak, but the last one, uh, then we saw that the importance of what the CEPI and, and research has been done. Uh, and and uh, I think when we now talk about probably, hopefully having a vaccine uh, in the next 12 months, if we are happy, as, as Andy also said, uh, if we not have had CEPI and others that have been working on this for, for a long, long time, that could be five years uh, before we had the first into a phase uh, three clinical trial uh, vaccine candidate. So again, I really think that the efforts and the investment in CEPI uh, has been uh, tremendously important. But when it comes to Gavi, uh, when you see that the, the, that that is also in close relationship with the debt situation in many of these countries, they need uh, some of the money that they have into the, the school budgets or the, the health budgets. Uh, it's really a tough, uh, tough uh, discussion where to, to 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 have the right amount of money to to engage in the the health uh, COVID response in, in in the in the countries. And then Gavi is not only about COVID nineteen; it's about strengthening health systems. Uh, you see that in many countries where Gavi has played an, a key role in in strengthening public uh, health systems and that is what we're trying to do now. Um, one example is that we are discussing these days is how we can combine the work of Gavi with renewable energy uh, projects that make sure that the, the, the clinics and the public health uh, service in, in many of, of the Gavi countries could, could actually have a boost uh, in the midst of, of, of this. So, so again, how to make sure that we use uh, the investments in the best way to strengthening the systems. Uh, so, so again, it's not only about vaccines, but when it comes to the fair allocation system and to, to have uh, that, that will be a tough challenge because um, all countries will think of their own population first. 
and and uh, so there are many discussions going on as we speak about these issues but from my point of view and what has been really important for the prime minister and also for me this the last weeks is that we will be in the forefront of ma making sure that there will be a fair allocation system uh, and and uh, a mechanism that make uh, the vaccine available for all countries, uh, also the countries that don't uh, have the possibility to, to, to buy it, they couldn't afford it, make sure that vulnerable groups and critical health care workers in, in those countries will, will have access to the vaccine. And that is important for us. That is uh, as important for us as it is for all the other countries. We are in the same boat when it comes to this. So, so again, that is why I think that is we really need to push <laughs> push all we can on, on, on that topic. But again, back to, to the debt standstill, uh, a part of what Andy talked about and also Katrina uh, tapped into that. From the Norwegian side, we have been very clear and, and we asked the, the World Bank to, to look further into that. And I know they, they, they say that this could actually, because of IDA um, funding, that could actually do something with the rating that could could um, destroy some of the possibilities to, 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 to give that important finance um, uh, contributions that they have now through those channels. But we are stressing that and we have uh, discussions going on with them. Um, and and that, is, uh, that is, of course, a really important part of it. Just a last comment about um, the economic situation. I got a report this morning or the, the other day on Friday about tourism in in the african continent and from january to march it decreased with 13 percent and we know that tourism either directly or indirectly has uh, 6.7 or 8 a uh, part of the, the the workforce and that is a, that is uh, over 20 million people uh, 23 million people i think that was the numbers and if we see what we see here now that everything will stop for the next months that is actually over 20 million people um, without any, uh, any uh, kind of uh, uh, crisis packages that we have here in, in Norway and in, in some of the other countries that will be in, in deep, deep uh, trouble. So, so again, that is just one part and we got these reports in coming in every uh, other day with new sectors and, and new areas that will be uh, hit really, really, really hard. So, so again, I think we need to collect uh, that information and see how we can use our portfolio in the best way and, and as Andy Sumner also said to, to use this crisis uh, it creates some some there are some open doors and some new windows for us to 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 to, to use so so we will do that uh, uh, just a small footnote there uh, first if you're interested in a tourism paper and all the things, you might want to look into our new event page, a COVID-19 page, where you see a lot of papers. And one of my colleagues, Hilde Gunnaros, she has written a paper on, on the impact on some of the development countries where Norway is partnering on the impact of decline of tourism and also remittances. Mm. So let me just say one, ask one question. When you say that you would like a Norwegian development policy to stress the need for effort, access to, to, to the, the development of vaccines, to making sure that they are affordable and to have a fair distribution of them. That would, and you have invested quite a bit already mm. in Gavi and in CEPI. What kind of policy areas do you see you will imagine some kind of cuts as we go along? Because you, I guess political process is about giving priority, something you want to give more priority, something mm. you have to give less priority to. Mm. So do you see now out of this crisis some areas where you might want to de reduce spending on? I really think that we that the portfolio is close to 40 billion Norwegian Kuna right now. And what the, the task force are actually doing is to make sure that if I could, there's a triangle that has uh, poverty reduction, that has climate action and vulnerable groups. That is kind of the triangle. And we need to make sure that the COVID-19 response and the more longer term efforts that we are doing is kind of in that grid. And then you have like health, saving lives and using investment, like making sure that the vaccines will be available for, for the marginalized ones as a part of that. 
the 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 the, the security network when it comes to cash transfer uh, part of the educational systems how to actually uh, make sure that the most marginalized ones that now are dropping out how could we make sure that they will be a part of this is another part of the triangle inside those three keywords and then you have a large part I think that that we need to talk about uh, when it comes to 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 hunger and and the sustainable food systems and to add into those that kind of hashtag you have uh, jobs you have energy you have um, you have um, uh, different parts of kind of creating food and creating markets and creating jobs uh, and then you have civil society capacity building but again, it's about uh, eradicating poverty, it's about climate, and it's about uh, reaching vulnerable groups. So I really want to be uh, to prioritize much tougher when it comes to reaching that kind of grid. Um, and, uh, and of course, when we have those task force going through this, there will be a lot of things that is not that necessary, or we should have like an exit strategy when to come through this pandemic. Uh, we might could kind of shift into more normal situation, but this is a really extraordinary situation and we need to to to, to have a, a, a tough pit stop and see how we should actually move in the midst of the, of this crisis. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's interesting you say much tougher priorities. So that's, uh, I, I think that uh, this responds also to some of the questions that are submitted already. Uh, but there is another just uh, question from uh, Gina Ekot in Red Barna that, uh, that's related to this. She asks about uh, CP and uh, would Norway count funding for vaccine research as development aid? Is CP kind of ODA uh, uh, yeah, approved? I'm and uh, and if not, mm. uh, and if your ministry is going to cover it, would that de facto mean that you will have a reduction in development aid from Norway? Yeah, until this day, uh, the funding through CEPI has been tagged as uh, ODA and in the um, political platform that we are running on, it's very clear that it should have that um, uh, that, that uh, everything we, we, we are engaged in investing should go through um, the ODA improve. Um, so, 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 so again, that's the part. Of, but, but of course, no one thought that we could have a situation like now, uh, three or four or five months ago. Uh, so, and, and no one, when we engaged in SAPI, thought that uh, we, we should end up in 2020 with a situation where we will be as much um, in use of that uh, of a vaccine as Malawi and Mozambique. We are in the same position. So th this is a part of the discussion that we're having today. But from my point of view, I will fight whatever it takes to 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 make sure that we will have that kind of grid poverty reduction, climate and vulnerable groups. And of course, I, I can't use my my budget for 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 engaging in in in, in like um, projects for Norway and and other countries. It's, it's about uh the poor countries and, and the countries that we uh, will prioritize hmm. okay uh, a related uh, the several others have brought in a question of what, what this will mean for the direction of Norwegian development aid and you have alluded to a few things but one major trend that during the last years has been that Norway has moved more and more money through multilateral multilateral channels through, through global institutions, mm. be them uh, um, multilateral or also private or semi-private, so various foundations, etc. So do you see that this uh, 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 this pandemic, but also the general changes in the glo geopolitical situation mm. with more geopolitical rivalry, mm. would change the way of kind of the, your your choice of channels mm. for channeling money? Um, I really think that it's it's the time to step up and say that international solidarity and, and the multilateral system is really, really important. And some large countries seems to go their own ways, but we need to be a strong advocate for the multilateral system. But when then said, we also need to be quite honest about there are some channels that might not be as effective as others. 
and we need to use that knowledge to actually, as I said, to, to, to be much tougher and to do also a prior to, to, to prioritize when it comes to which kind of channels and there being channels that have been used uh, and being kind of uh, um, um, invented <laughs> for for all time's sake and there are new channels and there are new channels that are, not, are working as good as we hoped and, and, and others so that is a part of what we need to work on on these days the other part is as i said when the pandemic came and uh, the, the countries were locked down we saw that the bilateral uh, relationships, some of the civil society organization were the only one that were left. So, so again, to have the right balance here is 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 really important. Um, and um, but again, I, I need you know the UN reform. Perhaps this is uh, something that could really accelerate uh, an important change. I really love what UN stands for and, and, and the important work of UN, but we should, as a, a large donor and, and perhaps also the most generous donor, as Andy Sumner said, we could ask some tough questions because uh, we can't have money being locked up in, in some rich countries because we don't know where to use it when we have knowledge about the situation and we know that it's needed more than ever. So again, it's I'm not sure if I gave you the answer you asked for, uh, but but again, um, we're in the midst of a, 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 um, a discussion and a work that I don't think we had that for for many years. So so a lot of skilled people are are working on it as we speak. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not asking for a particular <laughs> response. <laughs> no, you know, sure. so I give you, but I think it's it's a general discussion, right? So it's it's really important to see that there's a there's a general debate in international affairs about uh, nationalism kind of taking care of your own way of doing it bilaterally or whether you do things and invest in multilateral system for addressing global public goods so it's always interesting to hear how you position yourself and and uh, and um, and where you position Norway I mm -hmm. think in this landscape um, could I just ask uh, one question that I find quite interesting and is listening to what Andy said. He said, OK, the time horizon here is, is six years or mm. five or six years. It's a long, long time horizon. Uh, and you have shared some thoughts about how you in the ministry is now working with special task forces, setting up a rethinking. Uh, so I just wonder about the kind of time frame. Mm. Do you see your organization in the ministry working now as like a fire department? Uh, trying to put out some fire mm. or are you thinking mainly for this six year? Are you a mm. marathon runner? Yeah. I think it's about the kind of time perspective and it, it, it's about how you spend your resources now. Mm. Not only if no, it's a good question, money, but of course yeah, also yeah, yeah. your intellectual resources and how you what kind of projects and partnership mm. you you mentioned that you'd like to build. Yeah, uh, and as you, uh, all you know, we have like this reform in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and we really want to strengthen uh, NURAD's uh, role in, in, in that. And I think we have a good setup to actually uh, be able to, to handle a situation like this, not act like fire firefighters, but actually maintain the focus on the long term development uh, in the midst of a crisis like this. Uh, and that is why we, we, we gave the organizations a very clear message of um, flexibility in some areas, but as far as possible maintain their programs and focus on the more long term uh, objectives. And one part of that is the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. If we, I need to know that all my programs are heading the right direction. So one of the tasks that I've been given Nurad is to make sure I, I use it in Norwegian or Paris Vaska to Paris wash our programs to make sure that it, it fits the grid that I'm talking about. Uh, and again, that is not about what's happening in, in October this year, but that is about how we make sure that we are doing our part making sure that the, 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 the goals uh, in 2013, 2050 will be able to reach uh, and how we spend our 40 billion and all our capacity, all our connection and all our relationships built over decades 
uh, could could draw you that in that direction. So so again, it's a really good question because it's it's so easy that we just shift and draw our attention on the immediate situation. Uh, but what we really try to to make, to have the focus on the more long term um, development. Uh, so that that's that's a long answer to that. Uh, and then one final uh, remark, and that relates to what Andy said, and was also I alluded to in my introduction, is about the economic challenges and the risk that a lot of countries would basically default. Uh, they will go bankrupt, or we, we, they will need some kind of debt restructuring. And of course, Norway is a quite significant contributor to development aid, but in terms of debt, etc., we're not a very big player. So you need big global structures. Uh, and in some sense also, China is a really important country. Uh, so, so what do you have now in your calendar mm. uh, regarding debt policy? So where would you push yourself? What kind of international processes do you think are fruitful and where do you see this heading? Because mm -hmm. listening to what Andy said, also I think a lot of the research, also some of the UN financial initiatives point in that direction, that we need to look into the debt situation. We need to have the, our eyes on the big issues, because those are the key poverty drivers. Mm -hmm. So or maybe also Andy could, could jump in <coughs> and say a few words about some of the initiatives you see now that are, are fr worth uh, looking into. Sure. sure. I mean, I, I, I think um, it, it seems inevitable, given the income losses, that there are going to be a lot of probably probably debt restructuring. De debt restructuring is the polite way of talking about default. You simply stretch the debt longer. Much of the de the, the debt will never be paid anyway. So it, it's it's quite a, a world of make believe. Um, I think obviously there's the G20 initiative, which is very welcome on bilateral um, uh, debt standstill on the service payments. <clears throat> the issue there being because it's not automatic, countries are worried about the stigma, which plays somewhat to the World Bank's point about not having a debt standstill. I mean, my response to the World Bank on that point would be, if it's good enough for the IMF, why isn't it good enough for the World Bank? And also, the World Bank can either have a debt standstill now or a disorderly standstill at some point in the future. So it's up to the World Bank when they want to deal with this. I think there's a real sense that that some of the international institutions are pushing the pushing the can down the road in the hope things are going to dramatically get better. I mean, actually, even before COVID, debt was a massive issue that hasn't re hasn't been properly dealt with. You know, unless you go back to the, the HIPIC initiative and, you know, even that wasn't, you know, wasn't enough, although it was very effective. I mean, essentially, there, there are a bunch of these, these kind of international issues um, that I think need much stronger global leadership. Um, and so it's not enough for the head of the World Bank to just, 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 just say, no, we're not doing it. You know, the countries have to sort of say, well, if, if the IMF's doing it, why isn't the World Bank doing it? If the G20 are offering to do it, why is you know why is the World Bank not doing it, and why you know why only 25 countries or or or, or it, for the IMF why not more? I mean, it, effectively these these are these are questions that can be dealt with now, and can dealt be dealt with calmly, or they can be dealt with in a year time or in two years time, and it will be messy. Okay, and so the the concern that that countries will we will pay more for future debt. Is, is you know it, it it's going to be an issue anyway so why not deal with it now rather than wait uh, in terms of the or referred to the I mean there's also so there's the G20 initiative there's the IMF initiative and I think the World Bank needs to do more I mean this is this is where you know countries like Norway in the past have been incredibly important in terms of global moral leadership if you think of the Millennium Development Goals I mean we wouldn't have the Sustainable Development Goals if Norway the UK the, the Utstein Group, Claire Short and others, if they hadn't pushed for the Millennium Development Goals, we would never be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. We would never even be discussing the end of poverty. So I think there's, a, there's one thing is global leadership and influence, but there's others a kind of global moral leadership. And so to, to be making noise about debt and a problem that pre-existed COVID and COVID has just brought to the surface. I think these are some of the really important issues. 
And so to see, see richer countries make noise internationally and moral leadership is just as important as actual change in policy. And so I think, I mean, I hope the UK and I hope other countries are going to start making much more noise and maybe not, don't leave this up to the existing G7, find an alternative, find a global commission on, a global commission on poverty or something like that, a rapid response commission about what we should do about poverty and COVID and, and have a very quick response commission that's that's staffed by developing country leaders or uh, and 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 a mix of of, uh, of OEC or richer countries OECD or richer countries and so have a big global plan be bold it's about it's time to end poverty uh, Katrina uh, would you like to join in on this ending poverty global commission for ending poverty after COVID-19 Yes, uh, thank you. Of course, I fully agree <clears throat> with uh, everything that Andy is saying, and it's so important to underline that there was a debt crisis on the rise before COVID-19. And uh, debt act activists and so many people have been talking about this for so long uh, without the world listening. So it's extremely important that the solutions that we can find now, that they are long term, um, uh, good solutions. Uh, and we have been uh, um, working for a, a systematic, comprehensive and enforceable process for sovereign debt restructuring uh, created through the UN system, that we, we need something new uh, to address the, the issue of debt. But I would also like to just add uh, tax, uh, the tax issues, because we know that national resource mobilization is the most important uh, if we are to reach the SDGs. And Norway has been doing a lot of good work on tax. And I just think that um, I just want to encourage uh, Doug Inge that he, ha he has to continue that work now and not just put out the fires, but but to, to also work more long term, uh, because we know that um, there are so many resources that should be going now to the healthcare systems and the education systems, and mm. they're not going there. So, so yeah, so tax is also an important issue. Uh, thank you so much, Katrina. I, I'd just uh, like to join in on the taxation issue. Some of my colleagues here at Nupi has also worked a lot on, on the relationship between tax and development, of course, it's really important and for state building and building local capacity. But but uh, uh, would you like to respond to some of these yeah. issues about the debt and some of these initiatives that are out there? Just short. Calling for a mm. kind of partly technical mm. solution, but also some kind of moral and, and political leadership. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the last one, when it comes to taxation and illicit uh, financial flows, you know, the FACTI panel and, and um, uh, some of the other things you asked about my my schedule and there are many important meetings where Norway has uh, taken the lead also during the pandemic, uh, during the last weeks and months, uh, especially when it comes to illicit financial flow and, and, and taxation. And when it comes to the discussions earlier on um, this uh, this spring uh, and the Paris Club and, and the breakthrough actually when China engaged uh, I think you know that Norway's position when it comes to the duration of the tax and the the debt standstill uh, period. We 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 said that that should be much longer than only the, the the next seven or eight months. So I think we are in a, a continuous discussion about uh, um, to prolong uh, that. But again, um, there are so many uh, good insights and 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 things that we could discuss further on 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 these issues. But but again, um, this is a part of the long term but it's also a part of the crisis uh, that we are in the midst of now. So, so um, I will, I've took notes and uh, I would really uh, thank you for inspiring and engaging me and, and the Norwegian government to be bold in this uh, topic and in this area. And um, um, eradicating poverty is, is of course the the, the the main topic and then we should uh, discuss further on during the next week and months uh, how we could could do that in a best uh, manner and we don't have too much time but we need to to, to collect uh, all the insights and all the the the, the, the as i said the, the the reports are coming in every day and, and some of the picture are shifting from from uh, one week to another um so um, uh, there are great nuances when you see the, the African continent, you have Senegal and part of, of Western Africa that are dealing very good with the situation and then other parts that are not doing that well. So again, I think we have to 
to uh, to create uh, the, the the knowledge base to 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 see how we could use our efforts in in the best uh, manner. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. I see the, the time is flying, so we are already probably running a bit late now. So, but I would like to give the opportunity for Andy and for, to Katrina to make a brief uh, kind of statements towards the end, and then and then I give the floor to you towards uh, uh, to the very end, Dongyang. So, uh, if you can keep it short, like a minute or something, that would be great. Mm. Thank you. Shall I uh, go first? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you can do go first, Andy. Thank you. I, I think this has it's been a really, really interesting, and it's. It, I, I find uh, it makes me feel much more optimistic when I have these meetings about uh, about about good people changing the world. Um, I'd say that. So I think it comes down to three things. The first is it's clear that there's going to be a substantial poverty impact. So we need some kind of global commission or something. Uh, co-staffed with or co or co-chaired by rich and poor countries that can identify how much money is needed to fund social programs, what can countries pay themselves and what do they need externally. Then the money externally, point two, could come from debt standstills quite quickly. We just basically follow the IMF. It's not it's not that often people say follow the IMF. It's it's also interesting the World Bank's behind the IMF on this. Um, so we, 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 you ramp up the, the debt standstill to pay for the social programs. Most of those social programs and cash transfers exist in developing countries. It's a question of expanding the coverage and, and increasing the money. So I think there's, a, there's basically there's a three point way forward on some of these issues. But of course, it requires bold global leadership. The G7 of, is postponed uh, till the autumn. The G20 won't meet in November. I, I don't think the, the world's poorest people can wait till September or November. We need something much sooner. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for all the interesting discussions. It's been very insightful. Uh, I would like to just uh, stress uh, or have two, two major points. Um, one is that we have to have a comprehensive approach now. We cannot just try to solve the, the effects of the, this crisis without also considering the other crisis. Uh, the world was already in an equality crisis and we have a climate crisis and we have a nature crisis or biodiversity. And I think it's good that you uh, mentioned uh, climate, uh, but you also have to consider nature and uh, everything that we get from nature and that we are, we're so uh, depending on that. And we have to, to keep, uh, keep on track uh, also when it comes to biodiversity. Um, and the other thing is that, or linked to that, is that now we see that several international processes are, are uh, being delayed or are being post important meetings are being postponed. Um, and I think it's extremely important to try to, to keep on track all these big questions on, on climate and um, biodiversity um, and try to have uh, to, 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 to keep track on track these important uh, processes internationally now because they're also very important for the most vulnerable. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank yeah. You. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me to, to join in here and thank you for uh, for facilitating. Um, and again, it's, you know, many in Norway now seems to think that things are getting more normal now. I also think that part of the mindset here in Norway is that it's, this is something that let's just wait some weeks or months and then it's over. But as we heard from, from Andy Sumner, it could be like six to eight waves. It could actually be the next 10 years. It could define a whole new understanding of how to work together, live together and be humans. And I think that kind of, uh, uh, there are still some alarm clocks that should ring. Uh, and for me, it's, I really hope that we could pull the brakes and say, uh, uh, wake up people, it's not over we need to to use uh, and to play our part in this and make sure that and that's the best and, and and the most important thing we could do for ourselves because we are so interconnected in in this so again i really just hope that uh from the norwegian government side and for all the very skilled and, and knowledge people that i have around me both in in the ministry of foreign affairs and in in, in urad and also with partnering organizations civil society organization we could be really bold 
and and play our part in in this important part of of, of the history. I, it, it's 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 huge words, but I think we're in. Uh, let's talk in August. It's not going to be better. It's going to be much much uh, worse in 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 many of the poorest part of, of the world. So so again, I we need to have more meetings like this. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I agree on that, uh, that, that we need more meetings like this. I think that this uh, session has at least contributed to three things as I've seen. And the first is that in the ordinary conversation now in most Western countries, the, the, the people have been myopic. Mm. It's natural. They have mm. been faced uh, different crises. They have even had lockdowns. And in Europe now, uh, we are in a easing of their restrictions mode. And we have been thinking about ourselves, mm -hmm. or family, etc. Uh, uh, but we have not paid sufficient attention to the poor people and the people who are far away. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, your participation here today have contributed to change somewhat the attention. So I, that's a really important thing in itself. Uh, the second layer is that I think that this uh, webinar has helped to shed light on kind of update our situational awareness, shed light on the challenges related to health, but also to the massive economic implications of the lockdown and all the uh, changes in the, the global economy. But it also made us aware that we are all interdependent. Mm. We are all living in the same world and we are uh, small uh, changes in one part of the world will have huge implications mm. in other parts of it. Uh, and, and the third aspect of this webinar, I think, has dealt with what kind of measures we should take. Mm. And uh, and that we need probably strong measures. Uh, we need uh, measures that are, relates to our moral and political bias, and also the, how we mobilize resources. Mm. Those resources could be intellectual, uh, science-based, mm. but it could also be financial resources. Mm. And it could be resources that we develop through some kind of cooperation with others. I think we have covered all of these things during this webinar. So thank you so much for joining in. Uh, uh, and we will take uh, take up your invitation to invite you back in August to have a continual conversation. Thank you to all of you who have participated in the chat. I have tried to address uh, some of the questions that you have brought up in the chat function. So thank you so much for that. And thank you so much, uh, Katrina uh, and, and Andy for joining in. So have, have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.